Welcome, dear listeners, to Horror Den of Misfits. Story time. The anticipation for our family camping trip in the Appalachians had been building for weeks. My parents, my younger sister, and I were all packed up and ready to embark on a memorable adventure in our RV. We set off, eager to explore the remote beauty of nature, and create lasting memories together. After hours of driving, we found a secluded spot surrounded by dense forests. It was the perfect setting to connect with nature and escape the hustle and bustle of everyday life. We set up our camp, enjoyed a delicious dinner, and gathered around the campfire to share stories. As night fell, a tranquil silence enveloped our surroundings. The stars shone brightly overhead, and the rustling of leaves in the gentle breeze provided a soothing lullaby. However, as the night wore on, we began to hear strange, unfamiliar noises echoing through the forest. At first, we dismissed them as the typical sounds of wildlife but there was an eerie quality to them that sent shivers down our spines. Curiosity got the better of us the next morning, and we decided to investigate the source of those mysterious sounds. Stepping outside our RV, we were greeted by an unusual sight large footprints encircled our camping spot. The prints were massive, reminiscent of those attributed to creature like Bigfoot. Intrigued and slightly apprehensive, we followed the trail of footprints that led deeper into the woods. As we ventured further, the footprints seemed to appear out of nowhere and vanish, just as mysteriously. The atmosphere became charged with an otherworldly energy, heightening our senses and intensifying the mystery. Our journey led us to the entrance of a cave, and as we cautiously approached, a massive figure emerged from the shadows. It was a creature of legendary proportions, resembling the elusive Sasquatch. Towering over us, its fur was a mix of earthy browns and greys, blending seamlessly with the surrounding forest. Its eyes, deep and knowing, held a certain wisdom that seemed to transcend our understanding. The creature appeared to be observing us as we fumbled to capture the moment on camera. However, as we raised our devices, it let out a low, guttural growl, signaling its discomfort. In an instant, it retreated into the dense foliage, disappearing like a phantom into the depths of the forest. Stunned and exhilarated, we returned to our RV, animatedly discussing the surreal encounter we had just experienced. We examined the photographs we managed to capture, but the elusive Sasquatch remained a blurry figure in the background. While scanning the valley floor, for sheep, a mile from my house, I noticed two loping figures. Initially, I thought the figures were coyotes or stray dogs, but as the two figures neared an old sunken vehicle, I realized that the things were about the size of the vehicle. Nearly eight feet long. No animal could be that big on the res. I watched the two figures until they disappeared into the woods, across the valley. It was starting to get dark, but the moon was bright enough, so I walked without a light. As I walked down the mountain, I heard something yelling. It was like a howl or a yell. I started to hurry. Then, when I got to my house, I locked the door and spent the night listening to the strangest sounds. I'm sure it was a skinwalker, but I found this sight and was surprised. Twenty-three years ago, I was walking my dog through the forest close to our house when my dog went in search of whatever they usually search for, and I started getting a strange feeling of someone watching me. At first, I was kind of scared, then became more scared when my dog came running up to me, almost knocking me over. This was enough for me, so I headed for home with my dog rubbing my leg all the way home. Every day, I took her for runs, only for this to reoccur. 
Finally, it took me weeks to not worry about it anymore, and I started telling whatever it was that I wasn't going to let it scare me anymore. After a while, in some weird way, it had become a comfort to me. After all, I was 14 years old, new to the area, and very lonely. Then one afternoon, after returning from Arkansas with my stepmother, I got out of the truck to go unlock the door so my stepmother could get my baby brother out of his car seat. To my surprise, after unlocking the door, I found the house torn up. Everything that was a plant was destroyed, and whatever had done it had come in by breaking a window in my stepmother's room. Also, it had broken a picture of her and tore her room up, pooped on her clothing, slept on her cloth. This I know because of all the long hairs all over the clothing on the floor. Also, I found it strange that if it had been a person, why didn't they exit from the back sliding door, or eat any of the food in the house? If it was kids, they would have found the booze my parents kept in the cabinets. I knew at that point that it was the thing that walked with me when I went and looked into my room and it was left exactly the way I had left it two weeks before. I met my stepmother and told her that someone had broken into the house. She ran into the house and yelled at me to get my brother's bottle. I reached into the truck to get it and felt something behind me. I turned, and there he stood. No more than three feet from me. He was very tall and loomed over me. He had hair all over him, but around his eyes, it was kind of like peach fuzz. He had beautiful hair, and he did not smell. I tried to see where he had come from, and then my stepmother yelled again for me to bring the bottle. We just stared at each other, and I knew I was safe. In fact, I felt at peace. I can't explain this. He finally showing himself has left me in awe all my life. I have always felt alone in my experience, and have wished to share it with someone who wouldn't accuse me of being crazy. I turned to look at the house and saw him go through the wildfire bushes. All those tunnels around our house, I thought that dogs had done that. I took the bottle in and told my stepmother, and she started yelling at me for making up such a story during such a crisis. I told her it was true. She never believed me. The police were called, and a report was made. A couple of days later, I walked out with my dog again to a big rock, I always went and sat on, and there were some of my mother's things laying on the rock pooped on again. I returned these things to her, and she accused it must have been some friends of mine, but I'd never taken anyone there ever. I don't remember when it happened, but soon after this, I awoke late for school, and rushing, ran out the door to get to school. I loved this school. A strange thing began to happen. The sky went dark, and as I reached the highway, a semi sounded its horn on the other side of the road. Turning on his brights, I saw another set of figures bright as day. A hairy woman red hair dragging along with her, a child into the brush straight across the highway from me. The child was almost as big as she was, but she was not as big as the male I had first seen. In fact, she was not very large at all. The eclipse had caused the darkness, and I think the semi had almost hit the beings, and this is how I was blessed to see two more. But I have never seen another since. I have always wanted to return to the house, but figure there is probably no forest left, due to progress but my mind always wanders back to that time of peacefulness. My friend and I were attending a family camp sponsored by my church at Silver Creek Youth Camp. We had arrived late and chose to take up residence in a cabin in the hillside cabin complex. We were the only campers in the complex that night. These cabins are an open design with wide screenings surrounding the upper portion of the walls. Laying across from each other on the top bunks, Dave and I could see outside the cabin 360 degrees. I awoke at first light to a loud noise. I sat up and looked around, 
thinking someone had come to wake us from the church. Just then, on Dave's side of the cabin, a rock the size of a soccer ball came rolling down the hill from above the cabin. It rolled past the cabin and out of sight. I am thinking, what the hell? I woke Dave up and said someone is trying to scare us, and explained what had just happened. Then another rock, much smaller, hit the roof. This got our attention. Dave jumped out of bed, threw on his jacket, and made his way for the door. As he stepped outside, another rock the size of a softball came flying down the hill airborne and crashed 12 feet up into an old growth fir tree. This was very alarming to us because that rock was thrown with the velocity of a fastball. We decided to stay in the cabin at that point. 15 or 20 minutes passed without an event. Dave decided to investigate first. He recovered the last rock thrown and returned to the cabin wide-eyed. This rock weighed 10 pounds at least. I couldn't throw it 20 feet. Then we ventured carefully up the hill hoping to solve the mystery. About 100 feet above the cabin, Dave found where the rocks had been plucked from the soil. At least two of the rocks fit perfectly into the depressions in the ground. No way any human could throw these rocks from there to the cabin with such velocity. We were definitely spooked. We decided we were in danger remaining in the area, so we packed up the rocks in my Subaru and took off to tell my minister what had happened. He did not take any action and dismissed the event as a prank. What could throw a 10-pound rock 70 miles per hour 100 feet? No one I know. I lived in the southeastern United States for most of my life, and I've had several encounters with things I could not explain some terrifying and some just bizarre, but the one that sticks with me the most is from Northwest Alabama. This happened in the winter of 2006. I moved back to Alabama after living and working in Atlanta, Georgia for a couple of years. The time I spent in the big city was very stressful so when I moved back I spent weekends camping and hiking just to enjoy nature and decompress. Be it rain or shine, cold or hot, I'd be in the woods every chance I got. The area in which the encounter happened was very familiar to me. I had hiked and camped there many times off and on for nearly 10 years. On one camping trip in late December or early January, I decided to hike and camp in Bankhead National Forest. I was going it alone like I always did. That day was unseasonably cold and I did not expect many, if any, other campers there. Just as I had thought I reached the trailhead, and there was not a soul in sight. There were no cars, nothing. Perfect. I hiked to a good camp spot about a mile or so down the trail that was next to a running creek. It was late in the evening, and nearly dusk by the time I'd finished setting up my tent and collecting firewood for the night. It was just after I got a small campfire going when I heard two very loud tree knocks coming from the other side of the creek. It sounded like a Louisville slugger being swung against a tree at full force. A very distinct sound. My camp was about 60 feet or so from the creek, and the sound was from quite far away across the creek. I didn't think much of it at first. After maybe an hour had passed I heard the same knocks again, this time much closer. Keep in mind this was a time when all the Bigfoot shows were popular, and you had fanatics out in the woods all over the country trying to call up a Sasquatch, so I ignored it, and I figured someone was out there trying to have fun. To each their own. Anyway, if it was someone I doubt they would even know I was there. Again, I was alone, and I didn't play music or anything when I camped. The only way you would know I was there is if someone saw the light from my small campfire. Some more time passed when then I started hearing very large tree branches snapping, now even closer than the last knocks that I heard. This got my attention. 
But I thought about it for a while and said to myself it is possible that a few people together could break a large enough branch to make that sound. But I was beginning to get somewhat annoyed that they might be directing it at me. I always traveled armed with a handgun, and was comfortable dealing with confrontation. I thought if it was a group of people out there targeting me, they must not be brilliant. It's not very wise to mess with a stranger, while he is alone in the middle of nowhere. I continued to mind my business, stayed quiet, and hoped that if I didn't respond, they would just go away. After more time had passed I was still sitting by the fire relaxing when out of nowhere a feeling of dread came over me. A sense of danger washed over me, and I began to feel my pulse increase rapidly. I've had this feeling before from previous outings in the forest. But this felt much more serious and alarming. I decided that if there was a crazy person or people out there, I was not going to give up my position. So I decided to douse my campfire and quickly retreat to my tent. Those were my intentions, anyway. As soon as I stood up I heard the loudest scream I've ever heard. It was very deep, short, and like a shout or a roar at the same time. It was very close, perhaps just from the other side of the creek. The sound removed all doubt that I might be dealing with a human. Whatever or whoever made that noise had to have been huge. I did not bother putting the fire out. I quickly got in my tent, zipped it up, and sat there remaining quiet while holding my pistol and training my ears to listen for any outside noises. This area is mainly huge oak trees and everywhere on the ground was a thick layer of dried leaves. So I was confident that whatever this thing was I would at least be able to hear it coming. The leaves on the ground made it sound like even if a squirrel was hopping around it would sound like an elephant walking. For the next half hour or so I would hear deep grunts, and what sounded like gibberish coming from the other side of the creek. But the sound was coming from the same spot, not moving, which was a small relief for me. I'm still in my tent not making a sound and still clenching the pistol in my now trembling hand. Then I heard what I knew to be a large rock hit the water in the middle of the creek. It was not a muskrat splashing around, nor a beaver slapping its tail. It was a loud kerplunk. There were some more grunts than another rock hitting the water. This time it splashed closer to the bank on my side of the creek bank. At this point, things were getting serious. I was just about to yell out for this thing to stop when I heard another rock being thrown. It did not hit the water. It hit the soft sandy ground and rolled between my fire and my tent. I did not see it but judging by the sound, it had to be a bowling ball sized stone. I wondered what kind of strength it would take to hurl a large rock nearly 100 feet. It was then that I shouted out, Okay. I understand you don't want me here. Just please leave me alone, and I'll leave as soon as the sun comes up. A couple minutes passed, and then I started hearing footsteps from across the creek, moving through the leaves away from me. I let out a sigh of relief that only lasted for a moment. Next, I heard footsteps from all around my tent steadily walking away. I was horrified to realize that while this thing on the other side of the creek had my utmost attention, its buddies were closing in on me and had me surrounded. I sat there scared to death and listened as to what I guessed to have been four or five of these things walking away from my tent. They were no longer bothering to be quiet. I sat and listened until I could barely make out the last footstep in the thick leaves. I sat up the rest of the night and in the blue of the morning, well before sunrise, I gathered my stuff, packed my tent, and briskly walked the mile back to my park truck. During the long drive home, I thought about what happened and came to the conclusion that if one of these beings wanted to kill me they could have easily. They might not have meant any harm to me, but they damn sure know how to scare the hell out of a fella.
There's something in the Porcupine Mountains. I've always considered myself a quiet man one who prefers solitude and peaceful relaxation over the droning hum of the cities or the pounding bass of nearby drunken parties. That's why I moved up here to the upper peninsula of Michigan and took up a position as a park ranger in Porcupine Mountain State Park. Sure, there's not much for a 34-year-old guy to do with his dog. But ever since my wife passed, the wilderness has treated me just fine. Shepard's been here with me since I moved here those seven years ago. He's my best friend, and, being a German Shepherd, was pretty well suited for this type of climate and environment. As far as the job goes, most days are pretty routine. Usually nothing more than rowdy campers breaking minor rules, occasionally responding to fire calls, and the less common manhunt for a lost hiker. Black bears are common in the area, so there were a few times I happened across an unfortunate camper, who thought you were supposed to play dead should you find yourself under attack. Unfortunately, those folks learned pretty quickly that particular strategy doesn't work with that breed of bear. It's always a pity to lose a camper to the wild, and metaphorical insult is added to literal injury, when paperwork and phone calls consume the rest of my days in those cases. Thankfully, those sorts of calls are rare as bears are more likely to saunter away from people rather than become aggressive. But apart from that, there's not much else to be said about my job. The state government issued me a nearby cabin in which I live, and it's where I spend a majority of my time only leaving occasionally to stock up on groceries or firewood from off-site, and to head to the main office a couple of days a week. Things had been pretty quiet lately. The weather was starting to get cold as the spring waned, and the cool autumn breeze of Lake Superior blew in from the north. With tourism slowing due to the cold weather, I was able to spend a majority of my days reading and listening to the silence broken, every so often by a breeze moving through the treetops, their leaves dancing finely to the tune of their rustling. Today had been a particularly quiet day, with only a handful of groups of nighttime campers in the entire park, and the day staff being able to manage most, if not all, of the wandering sightseers, I was able to lose myself in my books without too much worry about hearing my radio go off. The pulsating glow of the fire sitting in front of me was mostly obscured by my book, but would sometimes manage to flare up just enough to remind me to keep it going. Stoking it didn't serve to satiate its hunger, but only to rally its appetite for fuel. Acting as though it were a living thing, it hissed angrily and doubled in size for a second before sheepishly shrinking back down. I tossed my book down and let out an exasperated sigh as I made for the firewood. I stood over what firewood I had left, and I radioed down to HQ with my ranger number. 26 to base. This is base. What's up, David? I recognized Phil's voice coming through the handset. Phil, I've got to run down to the market real quick for some firewood, and I'm going to grab some groceries while I'm out too going to be about an hour, maybe too sure thing. I whistled to Shepard too as I walked towards my truck. He immediately jumped up and beat me to the door, his tail demonstrating his exuberance as it smacked up against the vehicle. The drive wasn't too long at about 20 minutes, but trips off the park were few and far between, so Shepard would eagerly come along whenever a trip to the store was due. All that meant for him was more attention, not to mention the handful of treats the workers would give him. After unloading my groceries and throwing a few pieces into the fire pit, I piled the rest of the firewood next to my cabin before drawing a tarp over the pile to keep the wood dry. As the evening drew nearer and the sun slowly began its descent into the horizon, I armed myself with my radio and a book and loaded some kindling into the fire pit and lighting. I turned my chair to face the bluff overlooking a nearby valley. Copper Lake, 
colloquially named by the miners that used to inhabit this region, was positioned in the valley so perfectly that it took on a reddish-brown hue from the light of the setting sun. In the fall, the effect was only exacerbated by the red and orange of the forest, giving Copper Lake the illusion of being an actual lake of molten copper. The amber light washed over me and bathed my little home in shades of sepia, the inside of my eyelids a relaxing shade of orange. I was woken by Shepard barking at me before shifting his attention, and barking aggressively at my radio handset. There was a hissing coming through the radio with a voice buried underneath. I didn't immediately pick up on what was happening, but then I was able to make out the voice. Whoever it was sounded panicked and out of breath. Please, please can anybody hear me? Mayday, SOS. They shouted between gasps for breath. Shit, it was already dark. Adrenaline took over and I picked up my handset. Yes, I can hear you. What's wrong? Where are you? Campers radios will sometimes come through the radio if they're on the same frequency, but it's hardly ever anything of substance. Please, you've got to help me. There's something here. Where are you? I repeated. The possibilities ran through my head. Had he disturbed a bear? It was late enough in the year when they were beginning to hibernate for the winter. But that hasn't stopped people from waking them from their slumber before. I'm by water, there's a... Uh, there's a small mountain. Rustling of clothes and trembling fingers on zippers made their presence known through the transmitted sound waves. I'm south of the mountain, and there's water here. I'll... uh... I'm waving a light around. And wouldn't you know it, I saw a slight flickering light down in the valley below. I see you. Stay there, I'm on my way. I quickly threw on my coat, grabbed my handgun, and made my way to the cliff. There was a steep incline on the cliff that extended down to the valley below. I had slid down it before for quick access to the area, and now seemed like a good time to use it. I gathered only a few scratches and scrapes on my arm from the descent down the cliff, and hurriedly leapt up and continued in the direction of the light I had seen by the lake. Shepard hopped down to different rocks and ledges to keep up with me. I knew these woods well, and had ventured down into the valley before. As I approached the lake, my pace slowed until I was quietly walking through the bush, listening for any signs of distress. Nothing. It was as if this person had already disappeared. There were no signs of life immediately apparent to me down by the water. Then I heard it, a gunshot. One lone gunshot. The implications drawn from which were never good thoughts. Tentatively, I made my way towards the sound, leading me directly to the cliff face on the opposite side of the ravine. Keeping my flashlight aimed low, I studied the surrounding woods as I made my way by the rocky precipice. Nothing, still. Then, another gunshot. Although this one was much closer, as if it was fired directly next to my head. I spun around as I pulled my handgun from its holster, only to find that it didn't come from right behind me, it came from what was behind me in the rocks. A cave. Something felt strange somehow. I have never noticed this cave before. How many times have I lost a missing person because they might have ventured into this cave? I relaxed my grip and pulled my flashlight from my belt, crossing my arms and steadying my right arm with my left that was now shining a light into the Inkai black. A hungry darkness consuming what light my flashlight could emit. The darkness was almost palpable as if there were a shadow standing directly in front of me. Inching into the mouth, I called out, Hello? Are you in here? No response. Of course, I mumbled to no one in particular. The entrance to the cave was fairly sizable, about eight feet tall and maybe three feet wide. As I moved forward, the soft ground turned to a hard rock, my boots making a soft click with each step. It was a therapeutic sound for me. 
Shepard started growling and whining at the portal in front of me. He was never a fan of caves, something to which I had become accustomed. I was starting to get discouraged as I cautiously made my way into the cave, looking back to find him lying, whimpering still as eyes begged me not to go. There was nothing of interest so far. No signs to lead me to whomever had taken refuge in here, no signs that a bear had made this his abode, no anything. The air was simultaneously heavy and light, like if you were to stir up a mixture of oil and water. They weren't combined, just kind of entwined. I can't really describe how the atmosphere felt. I didn't allow myself time to dwell on it. The soft clap of my boots echoed faintly off the walls with each step deeper into the unknown. The air started to grow heavier, and the familiar smell of a rotting animal started to make its way into my nose lending more credibility to the thought that I had found myself venturing into the den of a local bear. Step by step, I moved through the tunnel until I entered a cavern, the natural rocky dome dripping down onto the floor in various spots within the massive open area. The water reverberated their sing-song drips off the rocky walls and harmonized with each soft step as I circled around the perimeter. There was something there a sound buried under the echoing drips, and the rock beneath my feet. A crunching, much akin to walking on a fresh heavy snow. I shined my light on the source of the noise, and then, I saw it. Slumped before me, under the harsh eye of my flashlight, was a creature humanoid in size, but far from it in appearance. Its skin was gray and tattered with putrid flesh hanging loose from its body, exposing the sinew and muscle beneath, like rotting meat on the bones of a long dead carcass. Two spindly legs protruded from its body, bent beneath it unnaturally with the help of an extra knee on each of the thing's legs. The creature's arms bore a similar appearance, an extra joint caused its arms to arch in front of it, where they ended in massive clawed hands, hovering over a mangled mass of flesh and bone. Its head was looking down towards the body in front of it, which I now recognized to be a bear. The lifeless animals first strewn around its corpse. The creature dug one hand into the pile in front of it, and slowly drew out a fistful of meat. The squelching sounds of raw meat sent shivers through me, and almost drowned out the pounding of me heart within my own eardrums for a second. It slowly drew its hand up to its face, while simultaneously turning to face me. It was only now that I got a good look at its face. Dear God, its face. Its eyes were large, and a horribly bright shade of yellow. A piece of skin under its eye was so loose, I swear I could see the white shade of bone. This thing looked at me, and it smiled. It smiled. Its teeth were like that of a deep sea anglerfish. Long, needle-like, and menacing. With bits of flesh hanging between the roots of its teeth. Oh good, you're here, please come and join me, won't you? It spoke in the distressed voice I had come to rescue. Nanoseconds passed before I had forgotten about my drawn firearm, and dropped it onto the hard floor. Fight immediately became flight and I did what any human with an instinct to live would do. I ran. Claws scraped against rocky walls behind me, and the stomping of my boots resonated in my ears heavily, until each exhale and gasp for air would drown it out, granting me a moment of mental escape, as the adrenaline moved my numb legs in a flurry. The skittering and scraping followed as I found my way back to the entrance, and burst into the open valley by Copper Lake. Fresh air rapidly replaced the stale and fetid air that had filled my lungs just moments ago. I bolted past Shepard as he quickly turned and followed. Barks and cries were paired with the frantic sprinting of his four soft paws against the soft earth, as we raced to the cliff, we had descended earlier to reach the valley. I saw Shepard in the corner of my eye as he raced to the regular path up the cliff. I was too panicked to look behind me as I began to climb. 
rhythmically sinking my fingernails into the earth, and scaling the incline I slid down earlier. The earth and nature I'd come to love was the only thing that separated me from the refuge of my home. There was no sign of my dog when I reached the top. The cliff wasn't too large, and he'd beaten me up it to the top multiple times over the years. I ran into my cabin and slammed the door behind me. I watched for Shepard to barrel up the path like he normally would, but there was no sign of him. There was no sign of anything. My heart sank as I continued to peek out my windows, but still, I saw nothing. I sat on my bed and passed out from fear and shock within seconds. Every night since then, I can hear a pair of long sharp claws scratching against my house, in one long methodical circle of the perimeter. The scratching stops, and I peek out my window, only to see a pair of yellow eyes watching me from the nearby trees. Those motionless yellow eyes match mine, and I see the moonlight reflect off its awful toothy grin. It's been a week now, no one has come by to check on me, my radio yields nothing but a soft static, and there's still no sign of Shepard. I'm running low on supplies, and there's nothing else I can do now. I'm going to make a break for my truck to try to get out of here. I just need to beat the thing to my truck I have no other choice. Part 2. Sighing deeply, I steeled myself and prepared to run to my truck. Preliminary peeks through my windows showed no signs of that. Thing. No sign of its yellow eyes or hellish grin. I stared towards my destination. My truck was covered in scratches and claw marks. Long deep gashes painted the sides. 1. I counted. 2. I reached out a shaky hand and grasped the door handle. 3. I exhaled and jerked the door open, leaping outside and making a mad dash for my truck. Tunnel vision kicked in, and I ran blindly towards it. There may have been no sign of whatever that thing was, but I wasn't taking any risks that I didn't have to take. Not after it's been harassing me non-stop. I jumped in my truck and slammed my boot against the pedal, kicking dirt into a cloud behind me as I raced for the path to the road. The dirt road was empty, and the path to the road remained clear along the way. Upon hitting the main road, I turned left and began making my way to headquarters. Every ounce of me wanted to turn away and just drive, to abandon my post and forget the things I had seen, but I couldn't do that Shepard was all I had left, and if he was still out there, I wasn't going to abandon him to be destroyed by that creature. My eyes darted frantically from left to right, scanning the forest on either side for signs of Shepard, but still, I saw no signs of life. By the time I arrived at headquarters, my nerves had eased considerably. I was still in these woods, and that thing was too, but being free from my cabin prison with a monstrous warden was reinvigorating. Fear and panic were all I had known the last week. I began to feel angry, rage replacing the pure terror I had felt when the monster was chasing me out of the cave its cave. I walked inside and saw Phil from the lobby, playing solitaire on his computer. The bell hanging in front of the door chimed happily, alerting him to my presence, and he looked at me. I wasn't expecting to see you, are you feeling better? His pace slowed as he approached me, sensing the tension I had brought with me into the building. It took me a second to process what Phil had said to me. What are you talking about? I haven't been able to get in touch with anyone for the last week, man. I peered back through a window, scanning the tree line, before turning back to face my friend. His chipper demeanor had vanished, and he looked puzzled and confused. Phil shifted his weight from one leg to the other, and crossed his arms in front of him. Are you sure you're feeling okay? I radioed you a couple days ago because you hadn't checked in. Said you were real sick and trying to just sleep it all off. I don't know what you heard on that radio, but it wasn't me. 
I pointed to my truck out of a window, look, this is what I've been dealing with. And before you suggest, no it's not from a bear. There's some kind of creature out there that I've never seen before. It scared the shit out of me and held me captive in my own cabin for a week. I tried every day to get in touch with you, with anyone here, but never got anything. Just white noise. Phil's eyes bounced from me to my truck, trying to determine whether I'd lost it. I'll admit it sounded a bit off, but I needed him to believe me. Where's Shepard? He asked, looking towards my truck, scanning the windows for my dog. My heart sank, and my rigid stance slumped a little, I dropping towards the floor. I don't know. We ran, and after that, I didn't see him. Look, I know it sounds kind of nuts, but I need help here, Phil. Please. I motioned to my empty holster. Can we start with this? Lost it in a cave. Need to grab another before I go retrieve it. He hesitated, staring at me with trepidation. What is this thing anyways? All you've given me is that it's not a bear. There's a lot of crap in these woods, you know. I looked at Phil, trying to figure out the best answer to his question. Not just for him, but for me too. I don't know what I had seen in the darkness of the cave, but I'd made up my mind I'd given myself no other choice but to find out. You know how we get rogue signals on the radio sometimes, yeah. I was responding to a distress call that came through. Followed the signs into the valley by Copper Lake. I leaned against the wall behind me, trying my best to look calm and collected while I recounted what I had experienced. I made my way into a cave in the mountain and found some inhuman monstrosity devouring a dead bear, crunching on muscle and bone. It spoke to me. I freaked out and ran. It chased me back to my cabin and I blacked out. He stared at me, his brow furrowed slightly. It spoke to you, I turned away silently, he continued, and your gun. I dropped my head in embarrassment. You don't understand man. The only thought I had was that I needed to get the hell away as fast as I possibly could. But now I'm expecting it, and I need to go back in there. Well alright then. You know I'm coming with you though, eh, he said turning away and walking towards the office. If what you say is true, I can't let you go back alone. And if it's just a mangy bear, well, backup won't hurt, will it? I felt irritated. He clearly believed I had worked up some crazy story and convinced myself it was true. Anxiety started creeping back, entangling itself within the synapses of my brain. I stared out of the window. The cool breeze of autumn had ceased the leaves were still, as if I were looking at a painting, and not at a living forest. Everything seemed eerily quiet. I narrowed my eyes, trying still to make out any movement within the brush. Phil tapped me on the shoulder with the butt of the pistol, snapping me out of my daze. I jumped slightly, but barely enough for him to notice. Let's roll out, he said. I'll drive. I put the gun back on my belt, the cold steel scraping softly against the velvety leather interior of my holster. I reached into my pocket and pulled out my keys, tossing them to fill in one fluid motion. There was still no sign of any life on the way back. The air remained still and grew heavy in my lungs as we parked next to my cabin. I stood by the truck and looked around while Phil began inspecting the scene. Jesus. He said, looking at the scratches engraved in exterior of my house. In that one word, I could hear he started to believe that something was, in fact, quite wrong. He circled around the other side, and I heard his voice once more. How long has this been broken? I scanned the forest once more before jogging lightly towards him, the light jacket rustling softly as my arms brushed rhythmically against the side of the fabric. He was facing a window one right above where I slept. It was broken, 
and I stepped closer to look inside. Shattered glass littered the bed. Torn into my mattress was a symbol, a smiley face with long needly teeth. Just then, the wind returned. It blew coldly from the north, over the mountain where I had seen the flickering light of the allegedly distressed hiker. On that wind, we heard a noise, a noise that caused my heart to race and adrenaline to begin its trip through my veins. A cry, the cry of a dog, of my dog. I was ready this time. I pulled the gun from its home and ran to the incline, sliding quickly down towards Copper Lake. The sun was already starting to set, and the copper light washed over the valley. The wind rustled through the red autumn leaves, which were now vibrant and alive from the reflected orange hue and the icy wind. I heard Phil sliding down behind me when I had reached the bottom. I didn't wait for him I sprinted for the cave, looking for any more signs of my good boy, Shepard. Shepard! I called out into the mouth of the cave. My vision blurred, and I listened for him over the beating of my own heart in my ears. Shepherd, I yelled once more, my voice faltering. Putting two fingers in my mouth, I let out a shrill whistle that echoed off the mountain and into the forest, carried off by the wind. Phil caught up with me as I stood in front of the cave. The entrance loomed over us. Another cry rang out from the cave, followed by his bark. With my pistol out, I grabbed my flashlight. Fueled by anger, determination, and adrenaline, I stepped forward. Foul air filled my lungs as I returned into the lair of the beast. The soft slow steps I had once taken into this cave were now heavy and brisk. I could hear Phil keeping up behind me, his breaths were short and quick. It wasn't long before we had reached the giant domed cavern. I hugged the wall, and my pace slowed. Shepherd, I said in a hushed whisper. I shined my light around the room, but all I saw was Phil. He was standing off towards the other side, now shining his light on me. Suddenly, a scratching sound. The sound of claws, the sound of rock. It was the same sound I heard as I ran out of the cave the first time. Both lights pointed towards the source. Up on the ceiling, two bright yellow eyes looked down on us, and it wore that same damn smile I had seen before. Its loose flesh sagging down from its body, arms and legs bent unnaturally, claws embedded within the stone. Its head turned around 180 degrees facing directly over its spine. It turned its face towards mine, and, it barked. I heard Shepard's bark exit that thing's mouth. No. Without hesitation, I fired. The creature dropped, and I heard the bullet collide with the rock. Ears ringing and half-blinded from the sudden flash of light in the dark cavern, I steadied myself and looked for where the creature had landed. I heard a scream echo against the walls through the ringing. I looked around and saw Phil suspended high above the cold stone floor, dozens of needles poking through his shoulder. The creature seemed to be about twice our heights with all of its knees extended. It held Phil in its mouth, about five feet off the ground, and I heard a crunch. He dropped to the floor, his entire shoulder gone, arms still barely attached. Blood squirted onto the rock as he let out another scream. The creature bent down and picked Phil up as I aimed my pistol at it once more. But I didn't have a clear line of sight. The familiar sound of Shepard's bark echoed off the rocks. It lifted Phil above its head and launched him in my direction, slamming him against the rock wall next to me. He fell twitching to the ground before becoming entirely motionless. Thanks for bringing me dinner. It looks delicious. Its voice was back to that of the original call I had responded to. I fired again, landing my shot perfectly, right in its grotesque face. It stumbled backwards before picking the loose flesh from its wound and tossing it gleefully into its mouth. Ouch, that stings. Why would you do such an awful thing? It laughed. 
I fired another shot, but it lowered itself down, and the bullet shattered against rock on the other side of the cavern. I focused on the creature again, just in time to see it springing towards me as it straightened its legs. I felt a large weight against my chest, and I fell backwards, pinned as I now found myself face to face with the creature. Its bone was clearly visible now in places where the skin and muscle were so loosely hanging. Gray viscous blood from the fresh wound dripped onto my face. It exhaled on me. Hot sense of death, rot, and decay consumed me, pervading my nostrils and causing me to vomit as I lie helpless against the strength of the beast. My attention was drawn to its hand. One claw was pressed against my shoulder, and it pushed. My shoulder burned as it pierced through me. It felt like a red-hot spike buried deep into my flesh. I was powerless to do anything but struggle and scream as it dug the sharp talon inside my shoulder before slowly drawing it back out and placing it once more on a different area of my shoulder. I clenched my eyes and gritted my teeth. I opened my eyes and heard it whimper at me, the whimper shepherd would often do as a puppy when I didn't want to play. It brought its claw back into my shoulder as it whined again. I heard a bark follow, but the thing on top of me hadn't opened its mouth. Shepherd leapt with his full weight onto my assailant, knocking it onto its side. He growled aggressively as he tore into its side ripping sheets of rotted skin and chunks of loose gray muscle from the creature. I scrambled to my feet and picked up the firearm near the entrance of the cavern, the same one I had dropped on my first foray into this forsaken place. I turned to see the creature backhand Shepard and send him flying to the wall. A yelp that I quickly drowned out with 15 rounds from my pistol into the creature's head forming an enlarging pool of thick gray underneath it. I ran to Shepard. His chest rose and fell he was still breathing. I wrapped my arms around him and lifted him up, his wiry fur tickling my face as I made my way for the exit. The creature stirred on the floor of the cavern, and its chest cavity was also expanding and contracting. How was it still alive? As quickly as I could, I carried Shepard out and back towards my truck. The light of the sun still a bright orange, reflecting off the water. I heard Phil scream from the cave once again, but I knew it wasn't him. Ignoring everything, I took the path around the bluff and continued to the truck. I placed Shepard gingerly onto the passenger seat, and I drove. I didn't stop for anything or anyone until I was at least 50 miles away. We're staying in a hotel now, off the parkland, and in a somewhat more populated region. I have yet to see those yellow eyes watching me, but I do hear a dog that sounds exactly like Shepard, somewhere out of sight. I'm looking for jobs and places in a more populated region, far from that abomination. I'm not sure if this thing is going to follow and harass me like it did previously, but I do know. That for those of you who are in the Porcupine Mountains, be very wary, and don't trust what you hear. There might be something out there something waiting, and it wants your company. I lived in Southern Ontario, and had an encounter with a little person about 11 years ago. I grew up in a tiny town and about a six minute drive down the road, there is a conservation area that was closed down 20 years ago, because they told us that it was turning into a swamp, which makes trees unstable. I personally believe it's for other reasons. My father is part First Nations, and he was always in that conservation area studying the plants for medicine, even up to this past summer. He had told me when I was a little boy that there were things in that forest that people wouldn't understand which, I did believe him, but I was also skeptical because I didn't know what to think. Well fast forward to when I was a teenager. My father and I were in that forest, and he was off studying one of his plants that he felt a real connection to. I wasn't really into that, 
I was more into looking for critters like snakes, frogs, etc. Well, I was walking west down the trail we had come in on, and I was a good distance from where my father was. I was just walking along, and out of the corner of my eye, I saw something leaning against a tree, so I stopped and looked over. To my astonishment, there was a three to three and half foot tall humanoid leaning on the tree with his arms crossed. It looked like a male to me. His arms were crossed, and he had his legs crossed as well, just staring at me. I stood there and got a really good look at this thing. It looked a little like a goblin, but not scary, just different. Its features were more exaggerated and disproportionate to its size. It had a larger nose and a large mouth with wrinkles on the forehead. Its eyes were quite large and brown in color. The creature looked like it was gray, but I always thought it looked like it covered its skin in gray clay or mud to be more camouflaged. It looked like it was wearing a buckskin. It was dressed very much like a native tribesman with a long buckskin jacket. There was also a tone of gray hair that was pulled back either in a ponytail or braid. It was also covered in what looked like gray mud. I looked at this thing for I'd say 20 or 30 seconds, as it leaned against the tree grinning at me. Then, as fast as the encounter happened, and this was the crazy part, the little man faded away like a spirit. In its place was a branch that was leaning against the tree. I walked back to my father, and told him what I had seen. He then told me about his experience with these beings, and that he'd seen quite a few of them in the time he'd been coming to that conservation area. He said that they are connected to the plants and the ecosystem, and that they will give you knowledge about the plant in return for pouches of homegrown natural tobacco. He said they are peaceful, and are very scared of humans, as we are extremely destructive and evil. He said one individual told him that we are like an apple with a rotten core. I'm coming forward with this, as it's time, in my opinion. We're living in a very interesting time, and we all need to come together to bring the truth out. Until you experience Bigfoot for yourself, those who have made claims will no longer be crazy to those who have not witnessed them. Bigfoot is regarded as a tribe for Native Americans. There are still tribes in South America in the deep, untouched areas that are being discovered, and many species of mammals appear. For me, I am from Hawaii, and was skeptical. But when I lived in Kansas, I changed my mind after it happened to me. It happened in 2009, and I tried to contact BFRO about it. It was in October at Chase County Lake, near Cottonwood Falls, Kansas, before 10 p.m., my ex-boyfriend and I made a fire at almost the far end of the lake, and I sensed something was behind me. The fireflies were out, and the glow of the fire was casting its light on the tall grass, and the silhouette of the hill was noticeable because it was a full moon. My ex and I kept seeing what you call UFOs. They would look like satellites coming from one direction, then they zip fast toward the other direction like a shooting star. Some objects would glow bright out of nowhere, and then all of sudden disappear, then come back in different colors. Now that was going on for a while, and I then heard something brush in the grass. I looked and kept seeing a black large object move, but it was silent as it moved. I was thinking are my eyes playing tricks on me? I still felt a presence. It was very unsettling. I kept telling my ex about it, and he did not know what it was, but I truly felt he was fixated on the objects in the sky. I kept seeing this large mass and I was getting frightened, so I tried to concentrate on the fire burning and staring at the embers flying up to the blue-black sky. On the left, the moon cast its bright light. As I was finally easing down, a sound behind us roared so loud. It was so powerful that I could feel my entire body to the bone vibrate. It was a long roar and growl mixed into one. 
There was absolutely no one on the lake as we would have seen a car pass, and before that, we checked to see if anyone was there. My ex does not get scared by anything, but this made him jump out of his chair and say, hurry up, and get into the van. He was so terrified he kept dropping things. So we got into the van, and we were driving off. We saw no one parked on the side coming in, but as we booked it down the dusty road filled with potholes before we hit a bend, we saw what looked like two very large headlights come out of nowhere, and they came at us so fast that we kept looking at the rearview mirror, and it separated from each side of the van, then just out of nowhere disappeared. When we got home we noticed that there were lights in the sky following us. We were in silence and disbelief at all we had witnessed. Then we went into the house and told his mom. She said, oh yeah, they are here. When my ex was a baby, his mom and sister were driving down a road near that area and had a UFO encounter. I have heard many eyewitnesses years after experiencing similar accounts, along with Bigfoot. Why? I have no clue, but to think we are the only creatures on this planet, and those discovered, it would be absurd to think there is no other life that has had to manage to be undetected. This would have been before 1938 before my grandparents were even married. Their names were Hollies and Sadie. They probably would have been in their early 20s. And this one encounter, which mom relayed as if it was an actual event, was just so very strange. As a child hearing it, I did not know what to think. But she told me this very same story many times, and I will share it with you now so that you may judge it for yourself. As the story was told to me, Hollies and Sadie were walking home one night in Sackville, New Brunswick, Canada. They were in between what would now be called Marshview Drive and Hedge Court, closer to Hedge Court. They were apparently talking about religion as they were walking north along Main Street, headed towards Silver Lake. It was then that they saw what appeared to be a large shadowy figure walking slowly around the corner. It was headed in the direction of downtown Sackville. It was hundreds of feet away from them. Yet they were directly in its path. It was mostly dirt roads back then. And they stood there paralyzed in fear not knowing what to do. As they looked at the figure walking directly toward them they took notice that it was huge. It was all shadowy yet featureless. Sadie noted she could hear the gravel on the road moving with each slow step. But there was otherwise no sound coming from it. As it slowly approached closer to them, Hollies and Sadie rushed into the side culvert, huddled together in fear. As they regained their courage they could still hear the footsteps, and they looked up nervously as the figure walked past them slowly. It was at this point they took notice of just how huge it was. Back then the telephone poles were not as tall as they are now. Yet Sadie said this thing was the same height as the telephone poles. Even stranger, it was actually carrying its own severed head as it walked silently past them. It seemed oblivious to their presence to the point that Sadie raised her head to look closer as it was walking away. It was at that point that Sadie distinctly noticed under the street light that its feet were not even touching the dirt road. It was raised above the gravel, yet still disturbing the gravel, as if it were brushing its feet along the road. Hollies and Sadie did not move from that spot for several minutes. They just watched as it slowly walked away. Once it finally walked past Ogden Mill Road, more toward downtown Sackville, they remembered they had friends and family also following behind them. And this thing, whatever it was, would be headed straight toward them. So they both got up from the culvert and ran as fast as they could to intercept their family. They quickly found them just around the booster pump. Sadie saw her sister Doreen and asked them all if they saw anything. But her sister and friends were bewildered with their questions. They said did not encounter anything. 
It wasn't long after this event that Sadie spoke to her priest at St. Vincent Church in Sackville, N.B. According to her marriage certificate, it was F.R. Raymond Disrosiers who presided over their marriage on November 23, 1938. So this may be the same priest she spoke to back then. He wasn't sure what to make of their encounter. He thought it may have been related to something called the Wandering Jew. But he really wasn't sure exactly what to make of it. When I was little I just took it at face value and did not question it. But as I grew up and heard the calling for Christianity, I had since come to the conclusion that this legend of the wandering Jew was yet another anti-Semitic story. I had come to assume the story of Cain's Mark as he wandered throughout the world was somehow synchronized with the story of the Jewish diaspora to render some new folklore. But mom thought that the way her mom Sadie told the story of this shadowy head bearer, she believed this was something they really believed happened to them. When mom tried to talk to her dad about it, he would not talk about it. And he passed away without speaking of the encounter. I was searching for others who had similar encounters when I discovered your website. And I was very impressed with the level of detail you have gathered and shared. I feel this encounter my mom shared with me could benefit your research. Please feel free to share this encounter too. And thank you for your time. I live in Northampton County, Pennsylvania. I was walking on the opening day of spring turkey season in 2015, 3.30 am, and bumped some deer bedding down off the main trail across from a field. I saw four to five white tails jumping away and snorting or wheezing about 25 yards in front of me, off to my left. I was a little startled. I wasn't expecting to bump deer bedding down so close to the trail, and only a few hundred feet from the Appalachian Trail. Well, as I was standing, watching the deer go off, I heard distinct heavy foot by pedal footfalls in the field off to my right going away from me towards the wood line. I can't remember how many, maybe five or six, but they were heavy and I could hear the thudding as they went. It was like a truck was going through the trees, and it sounded like it turned diagonally, to its left, while going up the mountain. I have encountered big bears up close before, in the Catskills, not in Pennsylvania yet, although I've seen plenty of bear signs, and they never made heavy bipedal footfalls, nor do they make so much loud noise crashing through the woods. Bears can get big and make some noise but not like this. Anyway, the crashing through the woods went on for under a minute, but I was frozen with fear for about 5 to 10 minutes. I only had my 12 gauge with 3 turkey loads and no other firearm. I had rushed out of the house because I wanted to get to my spot early. Well, finally I was able to walk to my spot, and nothing else happened. I don't know what it was, but it had to be really big. No smells, no vocalizations, and no visuals. Just a little freaky. Maybe it could have been a very large bear that was creeping up on those deer. I don't know but I did hear of a hunter seeing a Bigfoot during the 2017 deer season near the same public game lands. I had my experience. Not a real believer in the paranormal but just had something pretty freaky happen to me almost exactly an hour ago. I'm in Okinawa on Camp Schwab, and was standing gate guard for my platoon. At 4.30 on the dot, we hear a blood-curdling scream that was abruptly cut short. Being a corpsman and on post, our first thought was a jumper from one of the nearby barracks. Just got back from the patrol we led to check out if we could find a body and we didn't find anything. What's even weirder to me is that the five of us on duty at the gate all heard it, and when questioning the duties at the surrounding barracks, no one else heard it but us five. I know people probably think it was just some person screaming and being rowdy, but I've been in for five years, 
and the rest of us have 30 years of combined military experience, and have never heard a scream like that. My questions for the community are, does 430 have any significance in the paranormal community, given it happened exactly on the dot? Does anyone have an experience like this? Is this a common phenomenon? Is there any Japanese or Okinawan folklore regarding this? Thank you. Thanks for watching. Be sure to subscribe for daily stories. We at Horror Den of Misfits really enjoy this, and your support would be appreciated.